be to uh, present Steve, Mel Steve Nelson. He's the Sioux at the Peachtree City office, as it says on his headliner. Uh, Steve and I uh, worked together in Tulsa many, many, many years ago, and he happens to be a Facebook friend of mine, and after the, the recent tornado outbreak across the eastern U.S., I happened to see him posting some stuff, and I, I just asked him, so what the heck are you talking about? And, and can, I get your, can I get your presentation? And, and so Steve was gracious enough to uh, find a date in his, his busy schedule to present to uh, Central Region Sioux and anybody else who's out there uh, about some of the research he's been working with, with uh, Laura there at the, the Peachtree office and also in collaboration with uh, Chris Schultz at the University of Alabama. Uh, so uh, without further ado, here's Steve, and I'm not sure if Laura's on today as well, but uh, going to show us some of the things they've been looking at uh, uh, to do with dual polarimetric fields and uh, TBS signatures. So Steve, go ahead. All right. Thanks, Sue. And Laura is in here uh, with, in the room with me. Um, first, before I begin, I want to make sure I, I respect your time. Are you looking for something uh, total, like 30 minutes, or is it a little flexible? We, we have, up, with questions, we have up to one hour. Okay, good. Yeah, that's, I did something similar for our region about two days ago, and that's about how long it went. But I can, in an effort to um, make the presentation more focused, I'm going to try to be a little more succinct. Well, you can read the title here, and, and um, that's basically what we're trying to accomplish with this. And I'm, what, my motivation for doing something like this was just sharing recent events that we've seen in our CWA. We, we turned on our, our dual pole uh, upgrade was uh, made effective, I think, December 10th, if I'm not mistaken, somewhere around there. Uh, and since then, it didn't take long before, maybe even two weeks, less than two weeks after that, we began to see a, a few weak tornado events that surprisingly uh, did show a tornado degree signature, and I'll talk about that. Um, the photos you're seeing on the screen are actually from March 2nd of this year. And there's a four panel above that with some dual pole variables you may recognize, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And the photo does correspond uh, that location to what you're seeing on the radar screen with that. Okay, here's a, an outline of what we're going to be looking at. Uh, just kind of review the TDS briefly. I'll go over some strengths and caveats. And before I begin going in depth here, let me just say one thing that I am not an expert on this at all. Uh, dual pole has been just, you know, tested in, in Norman with a 10 centimeter radar for several years, but there, there weren't a, a large number of cases here and there that have had some good cases to look at the tornado debris signature. Uh, there's a radar in Huntsville, Alabama, the Armour radar. It is a 5 centimeter radar, and they've had that running since 2008. So uh, there are experts out there, and I don't claim to be one. Uh, but I mainly just want to share what we've seen and try to capture what the research and science is saying, what the strengths and caveats are to this point. Um, December 22nd and March 2nd are the two dates I'll be showing some examples from. A review of the TDS. Uh, this has come straight out of our training branch uh, material. And uh, what do we look for when we're doing this? We want the co-location of really especially three things. One is high reflectivity. The other is correlation coefficient, which uh, most of you have already learned about what that is. It's a measure of how uh, uniform hydrometeors are uh, from pulse to pulse. Uh, are they varying in orientation uh, with time quickly and space? Uh, values less than 0.8. ZDR is, uh, of the three, I think the more important than ZDR is rotation. It's usually uh, when there's a tornado, you have pretty strong rotation unless you're just really far away from the radar and the mesocyclone is, is quite shallow. You know, it's possible you may see a TDS without rotation. I don't know. There's been many examples of that. The final thing you, you could have, I don't know if it's necessarily a requirement in our experience, is ZDR near zero. I think especially with the, the larger, more significant tornadoes, you will most likely see a ZDR drop to near zero or possibly negative. Here's a, uh, an add-on uh, to what I was just mentioning. Three of the four things here are reflectivity, velocity, and correlation coefficient. I don't recall which case this was, but this did come out of our training um, material. This is from the Norman uh, Research Radar, and it shows that there's reflectivity here on the left that's fairly high, approaching 50 dBZ. Rotation is quite strong, and then there is a, a lowering a lowered value of CC that is, you know, around 0.8, maybe a little bit higher than 0.8, actually, in this case. 
I do believe there was a tornado on the ground at this time, but I don't believe it was uh, very strong. Um, but uh, let's carry on from there. Uh, strength. And uh, again, I'm not an expert on this, but the main points is that uh, with dual polarization data, you can detect non-meteorological targets. Uh, it's pretty hard to get values, for instance, of correlation coefficient less than 0.8 or 0.7 without it, you know, from a, a hydrometeor. We'll just say that. And that's just based on the rain tends to fall uniformly. It's, it typically has very high values of correlation coefficient. Um, a lot of times it's near 1 or 0.95 to 1 for sure. When you start to get mixtures with hail, it will go a little lower. But even with the hail, you rarely see values below 0.8. And maybe some giant hail or certain situations where there's maybe very little of it. I, I suppose it could go a little lower, but not much. Uh, we found that there is uh, there is a potential to see even weak tornadoes, uh, debris from weak tornadoes, you know, maybe if you're close enough to the radar, possibly. This is going to be very helpful in areas with no spotters or at night in rural locations. Um, you know, we're in Georgia. It was quite a bit of a change for me when I moved here about seven or eight years ago that uh, it's not like Oklahoma at all. There's not spotters in every county. There's not uh, lots of visibility in flat uh, areas. It's it's filled with hills and 100-foot pine trees pretty much everywhere. And we can frequently get tornadoes at night here. Uh, so anyway, what we've seen so far has been very successful. I think we've seen a lot of TDSs that did even surprise me. Uh, certain dual pole variables are well suited to TDS. I'm not going to go over this in the interest of time. If you can see that um, reference there, I think it's Rishkoff. He has a conference publication, uh, Serial Local Storms, a radar conference, 2002. But 2005 was, uh, I'm trying to recall the journal, I think it's the Journal of Applied Meteorology, of all things. Uh, I would, redu you know, check into those. There's plenty of others if you just search for tornado debris and, and polar polyometric or polarization uh, on the AMS journal search. You should be able to find those. But you can read that on the screen. Uh, CC, in particular, is the main point is that it's, it is uh, most suited, I think, to seeing a tornado debris signature. <laughs> uh, there's also some new research that suggests that estimation of tornado intensity may even be possible in real time. So I have some slides uh, from a recent publication that actually has not been officially published. It's been submitted. It's to the Electronic Journal of Operational Meteorology. Chris Schultz is a um, one of the scientists there at University of Alabama in Huntsville. That's where the armor ro uh, radar is located. It's a five centimeter dual pole radar. Um, they've been running it since 2008, and so he took all the tornadoes they've ever uh, seen a tornado debris signature, or they suspected there is one, and they plotted them as a function of distance, and then they looked at the diameter of the correlation coefficient minimum. So, you know, take that for what it's worth, and they found there is some correlation where weaker tornadoes, that's tornadoes colored in green in this image, tend to be closer to the radar. And the uh, diameters tend to be smaller. When you get to the larger tornadoes, the violent tornadoes, and remember this was running during April, the April outbreaks on the 15th and the 27th, um, they saw plenty of large, in some cases, violent tornadoes. All those red triangles are all violent tornadoes at the time. Um, those are at higher altitudes. They're seeing at three, four, in some cases, five kilometers above the ground. I think I've heard reports, I don't think it was with the, with the armor radar, that um, they saw debris up to 40,000 feet with one of those Alabama tornadoes. I think it was with the armor radar. I take that back. Another slide is they looked at, as well as uh, diameter, they looked at the altitude, the maximum altitude where they saw a lowered CC value. Um, there is some correlation there as well, where those uh, red and maybe some purple triangles are at higher altitudes. So we'll see. I think there is, from the examples we've seen, I think there is some correlation. For sure. Uh, caveats. Um, not useful for increasing lead time. This is straight out of our training that the training branch has given us, five to ten. We've noticed this too. There's definitely a lag time between from when the tornado is determined to touch down until you first see debris. And I'll show you some examples of that. There's actually also some lag time between when the tornado dissipates and when the debris itself signature goes away. That can be around ten minutes easily. There's a spatial offset uh, between the debris and the actual tornado. This is due to the same reason we see this with velocity signatures and the tornado damage. It's because of the range from the radar and the tilt of the storm. Um, usually it's to the left of the tornado path. So one of the cases, the March 2nd case, for instance, is exactly one-half mile in almost all cases 
uh, to the north of the actual tornado track. So the actual track is shifted about a, uh, up to four kilometers to the south of the signature on radar. Data overload, um, you know, this is something maybe we've all kind of talked about in our offices. Some of you may have dual pole already running. Um, it, you know, some of you during an actual uh, an event, severe weather event, it's I, I think it could be challenging. I think a lot of us think it could be challenging to how much time can we spend looking at all these fields, not just reflectivity, velocity, uh, all these dual pole variables every four minutes. And more frequently than that is we're looking at different tilts and different radars. So this is a, a case where maybe possibly the uh, someone who's responsible on the team for looking for verification or finding out what's happening on the ground with spotters and, and county officials, uh, perhaps that person could be kind of checking the, the dual pole data where the warning forecaster doesn't have time. It's just a thought. Uh, but the big one I've noticed, and I, this is one of the main goals I have for the presentation, is low correlation coefficient can occur in areas of low signal to noise ratio. Um, this is a big one because it's fooled us, to be honest. Um, it can happen very easily if you're not careful about doing some things. You want to look for uh, those, especially those three things, reflectivity, uh, velocity couplet or rotation, and lower CC to be co-located. And uh, even accounting for possibly some offset due to the movement of the storm, especially with the velocity, that data is collected about 30 to 60 seconds after the reflectivity uh, scan is completed. And that can cause some offset, especially with a fast-moving storm. But really, you can't, I don't think realistically, you can have more than a mile, surely not more than a mile of, of things being out of phase one. So if you're not sure, make sure, especially look at reflectivity. So I'll show you examples of that. Um, one other thing I meant, didn't mention was storm structure. This goes back to the way we train interns in DLOC and how we were trained in radar class and some of our modules, that uh, storm structure is important for issuing good warnings. So if you know, for instance, on a supercell, the tornado, you know, is typically located on the hook. It may move to the north of that or northwest even if a tornado occludes, but it's it usually forms in the interface between the updraft and the downdraft here on the southwest portion or uh, the rear portion of the supercell. And, of course, you can have other types of storms produce brief, brief tornadoes, but it's somewhat similar. Even a QLCS does have an inflow notch, and typically they'll form in that area near the inflow notch and just south of that. Um, Keep that in mind. If you're seeing a signature that's not in the reflectivity hook or it's kind of far away from that, question that. Don't just assume it's debris. Even though the signature on correlation coefficient may look like a, you know, a dead ringer, you really have to correlate that with other fields. So quickly, let's go to the first event. This is an event that was interesting. We had about six tornadoes total in our CWA, December 22nd. Uh, the above images got more of the media attention. This is, these were a little bit stronger tornadoes. Rome, Georgia is a fairly large city in northwest Georgia. In a rural area near Calhoun, Georgia, we had one isolated area of very strong damage. Uh, not much injuries. There was just one injury here, if you can see my mouse, uh, the pointer. Uh, that, that white object near the road is a bathtub, and that's where the entire family, about four, I believe, family of foreign, was thrown uh, into that near the road from their home. And only one broken ankle, I think, was recorded. Everyone survived. Uh, the three M tornadoes below were all part of the six, and they were quite weak. And in fact, the Fayetteville, Georgia, and Brooks, Georgia tornadoes were uh, so insignificant, we did not hear reports of the damage until a week later as part of our investigation on the uh, tornado debris signature possibility. Um, no one reported that damage. It was so uh, inconsequential. You're looking at the worst of it in all three of those bottom photos. But what's interesting is, uh, for those that know a little bit about anything about Georgia, which many of you, unless you're from the area, don't, that uh, Rome, northwest Georgia, is about 60 miles away from the radar. We did not see debris uh, signatures with either of those tornadoes. They were pretty shallow mesocyclones and rotation areas, and it just wasn't possible to see anything uh, as far as uh, much rotation, actually, to speak of, plus the debris signature. But with uh, these other weak tornadoes, they actually happened very close to the radar. We actually saw debris signatures for all three. And I'll show you quickly, in the interest of time, I'm going to go fairly fast through this. If I go through reflectivity, uh, if you can see my mouse pointer, one of the tornadoes is near the city of Moreland. If you can see that, it's maybe harder if you don't have a good monitor or, or a projector. It's nice and big. Uh, it's near this area, about southwest of the radar, about 10 to 12 miles. 
One of the tornadoes took place there, and the other two were in northern and southern Fayette County, uh, just northeast of the radar and southeast of the radar. And I'll have the times of when they occur here shortly. Right now, there's one tornado briefly passing through the city, near the city of Moreland. These were QLCS storms, by the way. And then northern and Fayette uh, County here is about when the other two are occurring. Steve, uh, just so you know, there's about a 30-second delay for some. Yeah, I'm seeing that. I, I have the audience view turned on, so let me... Um, there wasn't much to see. Let me go ahead and go on to the velocity. Is everyone seeing my velocity, uh, the velocity image right now? Yes. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, let's go through a little slower. There were tornado warnings actually issued for these weak tornadoes, and it was uh, fortunately it was because these were close to the radar, and we did see velocity increase and the rotation increase as it approached 95. If you can see the blue line uh, roughly going this way, it comes from Atlanta, goes to the southwest. We're Peachtree City and the radar is located south-southwest in the city of Atlanta. Um, it actually spins up very close to I-85 and touches down just east of the highway. It's a brief path, only about one mile long. It's, it's occurring about now. And then as soon as it forms, as many of you know with these type of storms, it quickly goes away. And really, you can't, I'm going to step through, and I know some of you may not be able to see all these images quickly, but uh, just take my word for it that there's no real strong rotation signatures from this point on, although there are suspicious areas. If you're at to the point where, um, uh, I think it's this point right now, Brooks is a very small font. I apologize for the size of the font. It's where my mouth is, it's southeast of the radar. That's about when another tornado is about to form, and it does increase a little bit. And this was an EF-1 tornado again on the ground for just a brief period of time. This is about when it's developing right now in this image. So the times are labeled on there. And if I go to correlation coefficient, keep in mind the times and see if you can see the debris signature and correlation coefficient. Right now I'm at the time of the Moreland tornado. Does anybody see a, a lower value CC? You can see the M or Moreland, that's where the city is. There's a little dot. Does anybody see it? I don't. Yes, well, that's correct. It's not there. And uh, in fact, by the time you get around to the next tilt, the debris actually shows up near the end of the path. The tornado is actually already lifted. And if you can't see it. I'm, I've purposely made this, uh, this image zoomed out a little bit just to show you how challenging this is. Our counties are quite small. Uh, what you're seeing on the screen is roughly about 25 miles east and west. So this is very close to the radar, and the debris signature is very small. You have to be zoomed in. It's actually on, it is uh, seen right above the letter M in Moreland. It's a very small area of about 0.6 correlation coefficient. And it's very close to the path, very close to where the signature and rotation was seen with the velocity. And it does persist. We're looking now at five minutes after the tornado is lifted. This area here of green, and there's some blue. That's values around uh, 0.7 to 0.8. Not very much. It's starting to disperse, and it's broadening with time. And it starts to lift to the northeast. This is the correlation coefficient. This may still be debris. Some of it could be uh, low signal to noise, uh, where the reflectivity is just not quite high enough. Let me go ahead to where the, the other tornadoes touched down. This was near Brooks. Should be showing up on your screen here in a second or two. Uh, in southeast Fayette County near where my mouse is located, this is an area of lower correlation coefficient. Again, values are about 0.6, maybe uh, slightly higher, very small area. There's a little bit of broadening of the debris. The tornado is uh, actually still on the ground here, but it's quite weak, very little damage, maybe a total number of trees of about 30. 20 to 30 trees down total and just some minor structure damage. And the other tornado debris signature is here in northern Fayette County. A little bit bigger, um, but uh, again, this is actually the weakest of the three. And if you go down towards Woolsey, which is actually in southernmost part of Clayton County, oh, the tornado debris is in Clayton County, but the city is, is Fayette County. Uh, that is lingering debris even though the tornado has lifted. So there's Definitely a lag from when the tornado lifts to the when the debris
persist. So obviously, if you're seeing this, there's a chance that this tornado, you know, it's already formed and it may have already lifted. You don't know. Um, it's not going to necessarily tell you that unless you wait a little bit longer and see that the debris signature is gone. Hey, Steve, have you guys noticed any specific pattern at all? Or, um, I mean, it's, I mean, it's hard sometimes for the eye to distinguish. But yes. Um, uh, well, what we'll do in this case, that will help answer your questions. Um, they're usually circular, and I think that's because uh, with the tornado, air is obviously blowing in. Strong convergence, it's keeping the debris or whatever material uh, very close to the tornado. One of my questions I didn't bring up in the last talk was, um, in, in the interest of time, is what is the debris? And I'm not going to have a, let's not have a discussion about it now, but I'm thinking, and based on the original uh, papers and publication by Rishkoff, I think it's small objects, especially leaves, and in our case it may be pine needles. So um, uh, with water coating on it especially, I, I'm not sure. You know, one of the presentations I saw a year or two ago from actually UAH made it look like it was uh, pieces of buildings and wood and, and pieces of trees and tree limbs and things like that. I, I think it may be smaller than that um, just because of the, you know, persistence and how high it can be lasted in its uh, area that it covers. Well, and if you remember on um, these, uh, the last three events that occurred in December close to the radar, there was very little damage with those. So it was likely trees and uh, pine needle uh, leaves, that sort of thing, that was causing those debris signatures that we just looked at. Yeah, I did not load the GR2 data for that, but in the interest of time, I wanted to spend a little bit of uh, time on this March 2nd case that you should see on the screen. I've got kind of a four panel I showed earlier. This is on the title slide. This damage that you see is in a different location from the same tornado. I believe it was a 29-mile path, a continuous path of that tornado. The highest it was, uh, rating was EF3, that, that photo you saw on the title slide. This is a high-end EF2. It may be a low-end EF3 at this point. I, I think it is. Um, two homes there, and you can see on the screen, received quite a bit of damage. That corresponds to the radar data that you see below. So there is kind of a pattern. And to answer your question, Sue, I think what you see is a circular minimum in correlation coefficient. You know, it could be oval-shaped. It varies, but I think that's what most people are seeing. Um, the radar data, I do have GR2 loaded, and that should help make this uh, more interactive and us able to zoom in a little bit. Give it a little bit of time. I'm not going to turn on any loops. I'll try to keep the stepping to a minimum and just keep it on one image. There we go. What you should be seeing is the reflectivity. Um, and this is about five minutes before the tornado touches down, just to give you an advance notice. This is definitely a supercell. Um, <clears throat> there's kind of a hint of an influence that may have been there one time. We, we don't get many uh, of the classic or definitely not LP supercells. We have a lot, plenty of moisture in, in this part of the country. Um, you know, we have plenty of QLCS storms as well. But this is a supercell. And it cycles between kind of looking like an oval shape like this to very strong and well-pronounced inflow notches with even a hook. Uh, right now, there's not a hook showing, but um, let me switch to base velocity. And there's a strong mesocyclone. It hasn't become a uh, very um, uh, a small diameter of rotation, but it's, it's had a history of producing some damage. We did not have a lot of reports of tornadoes prior to this time. In Alabama, this is about when it's crossing the state line into west central Georgia. Uh, the name of the county is Harrelson. If you can see that, it's a small lettering. Um, and if I go to correlation coefficient, we'll give that a little bit of time. You won't see anything either. So there's been no reports of tornadoes. We don't see a lowering CC at any time right now. <clears throat> I'm going to go forward one more scan, or one more volume scan here. Now we're at the time where in retrospect, you know, doing a survey, the tornado was touched down about this time. You should be seeing the reflectivity. Um, here's the velocity. It's become uh, increased, and obviously there's a tight, cir excuse me, a tight circulation. I'm going to zoom in one time, and I'll place a marker. So you should be seeing that. Yeah. Uh, that's about where the tornado touched down. Might be able to put some roads on this. There we go. <clears throat> if I switch to correlation coefficient, remember this is about when the tornado touched down. If I switch to correlation coefficient, my marker is red, so it may be hard to see, but it's where my mouse is pointing. 
there is no lowered value of CC. So again, we're seeing a lag in um, from the time the tornado touches down till you see a signature and correlation coefficient. We're looking at 0 0.5 degrees. The elevation or the altitude of the beam is about 4,000 feet uh, above sea level. And ground, uh, the elevation out in this area is probably 800 feet or so. Uh, we'll go forward one more. I'm going to stick with velocity here. It's still quite strong. In fact, it's increased. I'm looking at base velocity, actually. It says storm relative, but um, you can see it equally well in either. If I switch to correlation coefficient at this time, I place a marker where the rotation is. Boom, see the uh, lowered value of correlation coefficient. It's kind of... Uh, uh, an isolated area with high values of CC all around it that's most likely rain. It may be mixed with a little bit of hail, but in the center, almost co-located with that rotation, you're seeing values uh, as low as 0.45. In fact, if I can um, use up your bandwidth here and go up a little bit, uh, let me just go straight up to 1.8 degrees. Oh, sorry, 1.3 at this time. Uh, now we're looking at an altitude of about 8,000 feet MSL. We're still seeing debris, and if you go higher, you no longer see it. Um, in the interest of time, I know we're going on 30 minutes here a little bit. I'm going to skip ahead to uh, and take my word for it that it does, uh, the signature persists. But right now what I'm going to do is show you uh, velocity and correlation coefficient and then show you the reflectivity. At this time, it's moved a little bit further east, and you should be, yeah, it looks like you're there now. There's two areas of tight rotation, and just to show you what uh, our uh, 88B algorithms will do, I'll show you the GR2 algorithm for the MDA, and it should show you the yellow triangle that's actually picking the northern circulation as where the tornado it is, and sure, that's actually where the strongest rotation is, but according to the damage survey and looking at other fields, it turns out that was not, there was no damage in this area. So I'll turn off the MDA. It was actually further south of this area of rotation. Let me um, put a marker on GR2 at that area where the MDA was. I'll switch to uh, correlation coefficient. See that lowered area of correlation coefficient? It's very low. Uh, there's some values of uh, near 0.2. And it's kind of got a ring of higher correlation coefficient all the way around it. If you're just looking at the, ro the velocity and the correlation coefficient and that, you know, whatever algorithm output, you may say that's definitely a, cor a uh, debris signature. Well, here's the problem. By now, the um, reflectivity field shows an inflow notch. And if you can see where my um, point is that I dropped, where the lowest correlation coefficient was, that's actually not in the area where a tornado usually forms. It's not in the hook. It's in the inflow region. This reflectivity you're looking at is about 12 to 15 dBV. It's quite low. You know, obviously there is some higher reflectivity nearby, but it's not, uh, it's quite a ways away. I want to say about two to three or more, well, probably a good four to five miles away from where the tornado actually is at this time. So be careful. And if I go back to correlation coefficient, where the tornado actually is, it's, it's in a cycle. The tornado got quite weak in this part of the area, and it's starting to increase. The debris is not present on radar right now. What you're seeing on the screen and the correlation coefficient is not debris. That's an area of low signal to noise. I had the opportunity to uh, spend some time with Les Lemon. He just happened to be in Atlanta. Uh, the ABC affiliate here um, was able to host him for a little internal workshop. That they invited some of their uh, fellow stations to attend, and I got to attend that. And we went over this case because it happened just just right before the workshop. And he he believes the same, that this is an area of low signal. And you have to really question that. I'd, I'd be very careful to call that debris. Um, notice how, and you can do that. Look at the how it changes in time. If you go to the scan before it, you know, that debris is really, uh, lower CC values are just not obvious. I know we're lagging here a little bit, but at this time right now, that's the scan prior to that. And I'll go to the scan I was looking at showing you earlier. And then go to scan the scan following that, it's gone altogether. I mean, possibly a tornado has come and gone, like what I was showing you either. Just uh, what we forgot to do in, in that case was look at the reflectivity. Um, I think if we go here and one more scan, we'll see that uh, the velocity shows the signature is actually increased again. And this is an area where uh, the damage and, 
and intensity was quite high again. It, it approached EF3. I dropped a marker here. We're looking at reflectivity. Now the reflectivity is around 40 to 45. Uh, that inflow notch has kind of gone away, and if we look at correlation coefficient, where we saw the lowest, um, where we saw the strongest rotation, that's where we're seeing the lowest correlation coefficient. This is debris, and it matches the tornado path quite well. Uh, moving ahead, uh, you know, it's again, it's cycling. You should, here in a second or two, see the reflectivity. Um, this is near the end of the tornado's life cycle, but again, uh, the reflectivity looks like this. The velocity looks like this. Uh, this is where the tornado actually went through the northern parts of Dallas. It was weaker, fortunately, and I think there's still debris here. This area of lower correlation coefficient, you should be seeing where our mouse is just north of the city of Dallas. This area to the north is not debris. That's in an area of low signal. It's in the inflow notch. <clears throat> this is near the end of the tornado path, and unfortunately what happened is this, uh, this hook echo and reflectivity pattern persisted all the way across uh, the northern part of Atlanta for about the next hour and a half. And obviously we continued tornado warnings, uh, which we, you know, I think was a good thing. I was not here for the event. I was actually in, in Mississippi getting ready to talk about those weak uh, TDS signatures we saw at the Southeast Severe Storm Symposium. I was watching from home, and I was just, you know, amazed at what we were seeing because the Weather Channel, of all things, was showing dual pull variables uh, to their entire audience. So if I can skip ahead to maybe the image that I saw, uh, Greg Forbes, this is what I saw. Um, you should be seeing it now. Right here, it's a classic hook echo. Um, there's an inflow notch. It's well pronounced. There's kind of a, a larger area of reflectivity. Maybe, you know, I don't know if... You, People would call that a debris ball, but it looks pretty ominous. And uh, looking at the velocity, it's bad, although it's not um, quite as strong as it was about 40 minutes ago to the west or 30 minutes ago. If I zoom in just a little bit, I'll put a marker on where the strongest um, velocity couplet is. If I switch to correlation coefficient, it's pretty close to that. It's, a, it's an area of lower correlation coefficient. Values, again, about 0.2, as low as 0.2. These gray colors are below 0.45, um, 0.4 to 0.2. If you're not carefully looking at the structure of reflectivity in the storm itself, you'll be fooled. The really, uh, there was a brief tornado in this time frame, but it was very weak, and it was in this portion of the storm where the hook was. There was no damage associated with this further north area of rotation and lower correlation coefficient. So what I saw in the air from uh, the hotel was uh, everybody in Roswell prepare for a tornado. We're seeing indications of it on the ground with debris. And that's pretty alarming. And if I were in the path, you know, I think if you've been in an area that sees a lot of tornado warnings and a lot of storms, you know, uh, to have someone say we see it on the ground, that's going to make you take action. I think that's really what I want to show from this uh, so far. I don't have much more as far as slides go. I did want to show you this area. Um, you should be seeing it here in a second. It's a map of population density. I really don't know what the colors mean. Just take my word for it that uh, northern part of Atlanta, is, there's tons of suburbs. It's all, almost all of Cobb County, which is the area I was showing you, has got uh, suburbs of one kind or another and businesses. And Roswell and Alpharetta also have quite a, a bit of population. So this was air, moving into an area with lots of media attention, lots of uh, people in the path. And unfortunately, you know, our, our warnings were very good. In fact, I, you know, I give kudos to the staff here that were working that night. They were mentioning debris in their warnings and the statements all through Paulding and Harrelson counties to the west where there was confirmed, you know, pretty strong tornado damage that turned out later. They were basing those phrases based on the dual pole data. Uh, unfortunately, we kept that warning go going all through this area, partly because they weren't sure what they were looking at, and at some times it fooled them because we weren't emphasizing the reflectivity in our local training. And so I'll be first to admit that. I remember uh, being very clear about you need to have those variables be co-located, but I didn't necessarily give them, a, for instance, a threshold in reflectivity or, or any mention of storm structure. 
So that's the last uh, slide I have. And, um, you know, I can show you whatever you want. If you want to look at something else with uh, GR2 or any part of the data, just let me know and I'll, or answer any questions. Steve, this is Ron here in St. Louis. On the first case back in December, uh, you've been showing 0 0.5 degree elevation angle. We looking for the upstairs since these terms are very close to the radar. Was any kind of circulation at 0 0.9, uh, 1.3? Uh, I'm just curious what you were looking at uh, further upstairs compared to what's at the low, low levels there. No, and as you probably know, uh, uh, this was a lower case day. It was December. These were definitely QLCS, and there is no rotation. I mean, I can verify that. At 0 0.9, uh, we saw a little, but as all, uh, the strongest rotation, if there was any, was at 0 0.5. I think the one near Moreland it got a little deeper at 0 0.9, but certainly the ones in northern and Fayette, County, those two uh, had very little signature, and what little there was was at 0 0.5, very shallow. Okay, I appreciate it. Thanks very much. Also, yeah, you know, other cases show a nice cyclic evolution going on, too, and um, like I said, I know that, you know, you have two, a second one forming the south-southwest with the supercell cases, and I think it's a pretty nice cyclic evolution going on quite a bit. Steve, uh, Jeff Craven here. We've been kind of discussing offline. Are there are there situations where you could have debris from a intense downburst or bow echo? We were thinking about things like dust and whatnot, but we thought we're just wondering if the dust would be of similar size such that it, it wouldn't have lower CC values. Is there any has anyone seen anything like that with a non-tornadic debris field? Well, I'll give you two, uh, two of my thoughts on this. One is, um, well, I don't think we've seen any clear examples of that yet, for sure. One thought I had was that the nature of tornadoes is convergent, strong convergence and updraft, you know, that uh, the debris would be kind of focused in a small area, and so the concentration of debris, grass or dust or uh, leaves, uh, would be more detectable and cause a more pronounced signature. I think if you had a, you know, a downburst in straight line winds, a classic one kind of spreads out, I think it would cover a little bit larger area and be more divergent, and maybe there would be a little bit more turbulent mixing, I, you know, and that gets into the weeds about what we can see with radar and not, especially with the tornado. Um, the other thought I had, and I, I was hesitant to share this, but uh, if you can bear with me, the, uh, I, I, I may have, seen one case in January where I was sure there was a tornado debris signature. It was close to the radar. It followed the same evolution where you see rotation on radar, and the debris forms after, and then it goes away. And the rotation was similar magnitude, if not stronger, than a confirmed tornado just a few miles to the west. And I had someone go out and survey that area, and he said there was absolutely no damage. So I'm like, are you sure? And I'm like, okay. You know, we had there wasn't much impact, so we let it go. And before I left for Starkville, it had been a month after that, I, I wanted to go drive down there for myself, and it's really close to the office. I, I made a kind of a quick run through the whole area where I saw the signature, and I saw absolutely nothing. You know, even a month later, there should have been some snap trees or treetops or something. I just wonder if, is it possible to see debris from something that's not even touching the ground or causing impact? So we have, like I said, we do have 100-foot pine trees. Obviously, they're filled with needles in the winter. Uh, maybe, you know, dust or, or something like that, whatever we're looking at, uh, may be being seen. I don't know. I could share the images if anybody's interested. But, and I mean, that adds another dimension of possibly another false alarm where we see something on radar, but it's really not causing much impact. Steve, you were talking about the, the different, you were, you were kind of mentioning the pine needles and I, we're, of course, doing this uh, impact-based warning. And, uh, I mean, aside from population density type of uh, overlays, have you guys thought about, I mean, doing maps of the different types of, you know, the forest or whatever else? I mean, that, you know, I don't think they, we've gotten as fine-tuned as picking out what type of, you know, pine needles produce one type of correlation coefficient as opposed to 
you know, scrubby oak out here in, yeah. in Missouri and Kansas, things like that. I mean, have you have you gotten that, I guess, particular? Not uh, yet. I mean, I mean, we're all, I'm not an expert. I mean, there's, uh, Chris Schultz has looked at a few more because he's written this up. Um, I think I heard from Les that there's a student at OU kind of looking at this more larger number of cases and trying to summarize that statistically. But, I mean, so far it's just very preliminary. It's, you know, what's the lowest value CC? You know, is it associated with stronger tornadoes? I don't think they've looked at land type or what yeah. the, the, you know, is it forested or not. I, I wondered about that. I mean, I mean, pretty much our entire CWA is forested. There's some clearing areas and lakes, but and urban areas, but okay. No, I haven't looked at that. Hey, Steve. This is Ken from Bismarck. Yeah. Um, I just want to know. I, I got a presentation to give next week. Is there a, uh, a way I can get a PowerPoint presentation? Yeah, I have uh, this uploaded to my Google Docs. You know, I don't think I've made any major changes. And um, what I, all I have to do is probably just add your email address to the list of shared. And that may be the easiest because it may be on the order of 30 megabytes or something. Uh, Steve, uh, this is John. If, if you could share it with me, I can also just put it okay. on our yeah, whatever works. internet with, with the actual recording. Today. Okay. Thanks. Uh, any other questions for Steve? Okay. Well, uh, Steve, thank you so much for uh, taking the time out to do this today. And uh, sure appreciate your uh, your work on this, putting this together. Do uh, you have any last uh, comments either one of you would like to make? No, I don't think so. I think... Uh... Well, learn as we go. <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> okay, very good. Well, I'll let everybody know when we have the recording online and uh, Steve gets me the PowerPoint. And we'll uh, talk to you all on our uh, next uh, call. And uh, just uh, keep an eye out uh, and keep a look at your uh, training schedule. If I could throw one last plug in really yes, quick. Um, I'll be presenting a shorter version of this next week for the WDTB Storm of the Month on the 28th. So if you guys have people that are interested as forecasters who um, might think of this as being beneficial, please have them join us. Okay, that sounds great. Uh, thank you. And also, uh, Ron will be doing a QLCS thing on uh, April 5th. Yeah. Yes, April yeah. 5th. I was going to say, isn't there a second part to this with the University of Alabama folks on this current uh, webinar or not, really? Well, I did invite him. I don't think he was able to make it. So. Okay, I appreciate Steve, it. I'm here. Oh, hey, Chris. I I was just, uh, sorry. I was just staying silent the whole time, uh, letting you guys talk. <laughs> I appreciate all your work you did on this. That's what really made a lot of this oh. possible. So. And getting back to the the question about types of debris, it's, it's complicated because we don't know the, how how they look in the radar. We don't know what how shingles look versus, say, tree branches or things like that, or if they're water coated or not water coated. So um, we're hoping to look at that in the next year or so. But um, I know that David Bodine at OU is another person. That's I think that's the student that Les is talking it is. about. Mm. So hopefully we can get you guys an answer. In the in the near future, hopefully. Well, thanks, Chris. No problem. Okay, very good. Well, thank you, everyone, and uh, have a good day. All right, thanks for us. Thank you.